conference to introduce the First Minister of Scotland. Please welcome back our party leader, Nicola Sturgeon. We're about to hear for the last time from Alex Salmond as our party leader and as First Minister of Scotland. I think I can cheer you all up though by confidently predicting it's not the last time we'll hear from Alex Hammond. <laughs> Friends, I don't have many words I want to say about Alec right now, but there are two words I want to say to Alex Hammond. And I want to say those words on behalf of each and every one of us. Thank you. Thank you, Alec, for taking us closer to independence than we have ever been in any of our lifetimes. Please, conference, for the last time, raise the roof as we welcome our much-loved party leader, Scotland's First Minister, Alec Salmond. had my difficulties with it. You know, we had some spectacular fallings out during the 2004 election campaign. We've had strong words about a range of things. I can't think of another person that I would have rather have worked with over 25, 30 years. Alec is at his best when the chips are down. The more the pressure, the better he performs. And that acts as a great reassurance for those around him. You know, you look to him for leadership at, at the moments so of, of uh, you know, pressure or, or difficulty or crisis, and he's always there. He's always been a radical. That's the thing that's gone through absolutely everything he's done. He's, you know, I would, if I was to try to explain how Alex has gone about things, he's always been on the radical, pioneering side of things. I'm Brian Taylor, BBC Scotland's political editor. As he stands down as party leader and first minister, I'm setting out to chart the career and legacy of Alex Salmond. He and I have history. Eons ago, two eager, skinny lads attended St Andrews University. I first encountered Alex Salmond when we both arrived here at the University of St Andrews way back in the Middle Ages. Okay, in the 1970s, we were two rake-thin students. He was a leading light in the Federation of Student Nationalists, and I ended up as editor of the student newspaper. Some things never change, really. But our careers coincided when we penned a joint piece for the student paper in portentous prose we wrote of apparent university plans to check up on student dissidents. It was our moment of mutual rebellion. And this was your first big story. Oh, behave yourself. Maybe but your first big story. <laughs> I'd, I'd had a few. This was the secret files. I, yeah. I remember this. Uh, but even better, I mean, we had them, didn't we? Yeah. In the university hall where the old Scottish Parliament once met, we sat down again to consider his career. What were you like at university? I remember you affecting what I was, was pleased to call a Maoist cap at the time. But I, I, Well, it wasn't a Maoist cap. It was a perfectly respectable uh, cap. <laughs> what were you like politically at the university? What, 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 what brought you on to, to, to the SNP? Well, I, I was going to say, I mean, obviously politically left the centre, but then, you know, th that left a fair amount of room, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was, a, I mean, I, I was a, a left-wing Scottish nationalist at a right-wing, privileged, highly anglicised university. And I had a great time. Uh, I mean, it's, it's a perfect thing, isn't it? You're rebelling non-stop, constantly. You've got windmills to tilt it all over the place. I actually think in some ways I came to St Andrews to do that. 
Uh, I mean, I, I think it was kind of coming was an act of rebellion in itself. And surprisingly, of course, you met some, uh, you met the occasional punter like yourself uh, as well as well as the <laughs> people you expected to meet. But let's say that you were introduced to a new milieu of society, the type of which you'd never met before. Alex Salmond arrived at St Andrews from his local comprehensive in Linlithgow, a former choir boy conscious of his modest background. So, you know, he has a, a, almost an anxiety to demonstrate that, you know, regardless of, of where you're your cohabitees at university had come from, that you, you, know, that, uh, you could come from a, a comprehensive school in Scotland and demonstrate you could do as well, if not better, mm -hmm. on anything. So there was a kind of, there was a kind of imperative to, to, to make a sort of demonstration. I'm not, I mean, I don't get the impression that's consumed by my student life. I mean, there was plenty of other things I consumed which were nothing to do with rebellion or <laughs> politics. <laughs> Have you always been trying to point that out, always been poking the establishment? Some would say you've joined it. Well, I, um, well hopefully I can poke it from within then. <laughs> I mean, look, the, the best thing, when you become First Minister of Scotland, it doesn't mean you have to regard yourself as part of the, uh, part of the establishment. In fact, and your, your attitude to the, the flummery of politics uh, doesn't have to change, even when occasionally you have to take part in it. After university, Alex Salmon joined the left-wing 79 group within the SNP. The group was proscribed and key members, including Alex Salmond, expelled for a time in the early 80s. Those of us who put Scotland and the party above narrow personal or political obsessions will not tolerate behaviour which is divisive and harmful. But by 1987, he was firmly back in the party and clearly part of its future. Alex Elliot Anderson Salmond, 19,450. Yeah! Our objective is to break the power of English Toryism over the Scottish people, and in the next parliament, that's what we intend to do. Thank you very much. I think my first memory of Alex Salmond being on my radar screen was listening to Kay Ulrich talked to me about this wonderful young up-and-coming future leader of the SNP who had the loveliest brown eyes. Well, we're joined now by Alex Salmond in Aberdeen, the new SNP MP for Banff and Buchan. Congratulations. Thank you. I, I remember <laughs> watching him and thinking, I think she's maybe exaggerating that a wee bit, but anyway, he was clearly, you know, the, the up-and-coming person. What sort of disruptive tactics will you adopt in Scotland and in Westminster, do you think, in the coming session? Well, we've got a plan of action for how Scotland could oppose the Tories effectively and not the powder puff opposition we've had from the Labour Party over the last eight years. You went down there, you're going down there as a, as a Scottish National Party member, you're going down there to, to you know, as, as a revolutionary, to, to, to break up the union, to, to, to end the, 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 the union party. To break the power of the state of the United Kingdom over the Scottish people, as I may have said. Yes. <laughs> Listen, it, it wasn't exactly a, a career move. Uh, I mean, the, the SNP had two members of parliament when I stood for, for election in Bath and Buchan. So it was hardly, uh, you know, it was hardly <laughs> at that stage looked like it was a, uh, an unassailable sweep to power uh, from the position of three MPs in a parliament of 650. So th that's the situation, that's where you are. It was very quickly apparent to, to me that if the SNP were to make progress in any sort of progress, then the first thing you had to do was to be noticed. And Alex Salmond had a plan for how to get noticed. The rebel had been studying the rule book. Within less than a year of arriving at, at Westminster, still a young man, he's in his early 30s, he chooses to disrupt Nigel Lawson's 1980 uh, budget. The budget is a statement, it's not actually a speech, people don't understand that. It's a statement that's being made to the House of Commons. And the convention is very, very strongly, you don't interrupt ministers when they're making statements. He does so having read up on parliamentary procedure. Uh, he knows what will happen if he interrupts, but he knows 
the, the media response will be, you know, quite colossal. Order! 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 The Honourable Gentleman knows that if he persists, I shall have no option but to use the disciplinary part, which I, I do hope, I do hope that, I do hope that, order, order, order. I've got several warnings because the Speaker's always pretty tolerant, especially if you're relatively new. Alex Salmon, the Vice Chairman of the SNP responsible for publicity, has already on a vote been expelled from the House of Commons. But in the end, uh, he had to leave. But of course he'd achieved what he wanted to do, was he'd interrupted the Chancellor. He had established himself as being someone who was not going to be ruled by the conventions of the House of Commons and he made a point which he thought was an essential point so far as Scotland was concerned. What it said to Westminster is you, you better keep an eye on that bit of the House of Commons because there's somebody who's got a lot to say for himself and is able to make a big impact when he decides to do so. I mean, if you're free members in a parliament at 650 and you, well, if you always play the game you'll always lose. Uh, and therefore you have to have a different strategy. It doesn't mean it's uh, impossible, it just means it's more difficult. Uh, and therefore you set about making sure that the point of view you believe you're validly representing, that point of view of Scotland and its need for progress towards independence can be represented in that position. So what I did was I, I learned the rules of the institution uh, so as that I could deploy these rules uh, to make the, the case I wanted to make, occasionally perhaps stepping outside the rules, but always knowing what the rules were, which was probably more than 90% of the rest of the 650 members of Parliament did, or do for that matter. There were plenty of romantics uh, in, uh, in the Scottish National Party and people who were extraordinarily admirable. Uh, there was plenty of uh, characters, <laughs> some very quixotic, were all lovable in the SNP. What the SNP perhaps lacked was a, a harder economic and political edge. I hope to, with others, uh, to be the, the solution to, to that gap. I think perhaps some of Alex's public persona is maybe driven not so much by the fact he's been First Minister, but by the fact that in his early days in politics he was down in Westminster, one of a very small group in a very hostile environment, and he had to make his name, he had to have his voice heard, he had to stand out from the crowd, and he did that really successfully. So I suppose in that kind of environment it's difficult to let the softer side of your personality shine through. Which brings us to the question, is that style which has lasted throughout his career too uncompromising, too aggressive? The charming persona, the charming Alex Salmond is very easy to like. He's engaging, funny, he will remember details, uh, he will ask after things, uh, and that is immensely uh, attractive. But it, it's easily cancelled out by the, the other side of him, which is a bully. There is no other way of, of describing it. Uh, he can be ferocious, unnecessarily uh, personal, uh, condescending, patronising, dismissive, and none of those in whatever uh, context, and we're all prone to them, uh, are attractive traits. There was one occasion I remember uh, quite fondly, um, Nicol Stephen, who at the time was the Liberal leader in 2007, it was December 2007, and he'd accused the First Minister of sleaze over the uh, uh, Donald Trump planning application. And I remember the First Minister came back up after and he says, I'm, I'm not happy with that, I'm not happy, I'll, I'll get him next week. And I remember thinking, you know, you know, the whole week he was looking forward to the next week's First Minister's questions. And I think Nicol Stephen could have asked about any number of things. He could have asked about high hedges or dog fouling or anything. He was getting the response he got. Can I remind him what sleaze actually is? Sleaze is taking 0.4 million pounds from a jailed donor, using it to finance election campaigns in England and Scotland, refusing to get the money back. That's what sleaze is. One of those moments where, you know, maybe you shouldn't uh, be so happy he said it in the way that he said it, but it was very potent and it was quite funny. His political style, I would describe as sort of flamboyant pugilism. I mean, he likes to take on his opponent, cuff his opponent around the lugs and leave them 
lying gasping for breath. That's his style. Um, probably he managed to do that with me on a number of occasions. I don't dispute it. I've just been uh, handed the uh, indications from the latest uh, panel-based poll to be released today. I don't think when somebody simply dismisses you and you know, seeks to just to put you down actually creates any you don't learn, I wouldn't say we ever learned anything at First Minister's questions. It modesty forbids the trust ratings for the various political <laughs> leaders for mentioning it, uh, mine in particular. And let me say all of the Unionist Party coalition are negative in terms of trust. That doesn't surprise me. Nicola Sturgeon emerges with glowing yeah. trust ratings and I'm sure she'll take forward the cudgels in the future. As with every other walk of life, if you over-egg the pudding, it can be counterproductive. And sometimes I've wondered if, you know, once he got his foot in the accelerator, I'm, I'm going for you, um, and I'm not just going to demolish your argument, rubbish you, and um, leave you out there, flatten your back somewhere. <clears throat> I'm going to actually try and make sure that the only person standing after this contest is me, Alex Salmon. You might expect his opponents to feel the heat of his argument, but it's also been claimed that he is confrontational with colleagues. All leaders have a very specific brief as to what they're seeking to do, and he's very much led from the front. Um, but you very much had to go along with Alec, or if you didn't go along with Alec, then you were outside the tent. What was it like outside the tent? You didn't want to be outside the tent. <laughs> One of the difficulties Alec has, he is often right, frequently, usually almost always right, not always. Uh, but that also means he doesn't believe that other people are likely to be right when you have a conversation with them. And sometimes they are. Uh, and it is, it, it's quite difficult sometimes to have that conversation, even for close colleagues to have that conversation. But you have to have it. And having served in you know, his government, I know that there are times that you need to say to him, look, stop. You know, this is how it is. We need to have a conversation on that basis. But I've also never found him unwilling to do that. And he is absolutely willing to change his mind if he has to. I mean, I've seen that innumerable times. He listens. You have to get him to listen, but he listens. We, we hear it said you can be tough. Are, are you really tough on colleagues? Can you be intimidatory sometimes? Can you be too hard, too aggressive sometimes on, on colleagues or people who work for you? Yeah, tough, sure. Uh, I have never asked somebody to do something that I wouldn't do. And I've never asked somebody to do something that I know that they couldn't do. So if I'm tough on people, as I am occasionally, it's because I want them and I know they can achieve. Uh, and I'm never tough on people who I believe can't do it because the, their abilities lie elsewhere. And I uh, am tougher on uh, the powerful than I am on the weak. In 1990, I was once again reporting on Alex Salmond. The departing leader himself, while holding his peace for now, is known to favour Margaret Ewing and to harbour a long-standing suspicion of Alex Salmond. By now, he was contesting Margaret Ewing for the leadership. Alex Salmond, the one-time party rebel, was confronting a scion of the SNP's Ewing dynasty. I've never made any secret that uh, I'm a socialist within the Scottish National Party, and I think the party as a whole it has now come clean and said we're a radical left of centre campaigning party. In your early days you described yourself as a socialist, would you still call yourself that? I'm a social democrat and, uh, and have been for a long time, probably even when I described myself as a socialist. And a social democracy is part of the great socialist pantheon, but what does social democracy mean? Well, it is that balance between acknowledging the, the need for a competitive economy. Nobody in this world owes Scotland a living, uh, but also understanding that the essence of what makes society and humanity worthwhile is the ability of what we share with each other. So it's that social perspective, that social justice, allied and married with the competitive economy. Margaret Ewing MP 186, Alex Salmond MP 486. <laughs> Alex Salmond won and began his campaign to modernise the party and sharpen its message. His long-term project? To supplant Scottish Labour on the centre-left. The Labour leadership may win the battle for the yuppie votes in the south. 
We're going to win the battle for the hearts and minds of the Scottish people. We were all very clear at that time that the SNP had to change and the SNP had to develop a very clear political appeal. We had to replace the Labour Party in West Central Scotland. You could argue that we've done that. It took us a bit longer than what we had intended. But Alec was always very clear at that point about the challenge that was in front of us. And it was about becoming a credible, credible political party. I think at the time we felt the SNP hadn't really focused enough on the, the, the urban labour areas. That we'd kind of backed away from the straight on, head on argument with labour in those areas. And we wanted to change that. The irony is that arguably the major achievement of his first spell as leader was working with Labour to achieve a double yes vote in the 1997 devolution referendum. One thing well and truly cut. This is a good day for Scotland. And it's a good day for Britain and the United Kingdom too. We said, trust the people. We did trust the people. And the people have had the courage and the confidence to trust themselves. The Scottish Parliament adjourned on the 25th day of March in the year 1707 is hereby reconvened. For lots of people, myself included, it was one of the greatest days of my life. Uh, and I'll tell you something, the, until perhaps this referendum campaign, when the enthusiasm of the people was so palpable, it was so effervescent, so electric uh, in terms of the political process, that day, that opening, was probably the only time in politics that I've experienced the same thing to the same degree. I mean, people were hanging out the windows. <laughs> as the MSPs of all parties were cheered into the Assembly Hall, which was serving as the Parliament, they were cheered into the Parliament. Uh, I don't know if there's many Parliaments established in the world where you can say that, cheered into the Parliament by a genuine appreciation of the, of the people of the nation. A year on from his greatest day, Alex Salmond shocked his party and Scotland by walking away from the leadership. I talked him out of it three, at least three times. I might have talked to him out of it four, uh, talked him out of it four times. And then the last time, I just his mind was made up, and he said to me, "Look, everybody, all the press like you, so you've got to stand. I'll get out the road, make it easy for you, and you go and do it, and we'll be fine." And well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That was his rationale. That's, that's why Alex Salmond gave, uh, resigned in, in 2000. He felt he was the, the problem and the issue and he wanted to enable the party to move on and he thought that my leadership would enable that to happen. I'd become the story for the SNP. Uh, I was aware that there were, there were uh, uh, a number of, of newspapers and newspapers were still reasonably important then, much less so now, uh, who uh, you know, regarded the SNP as me and, and didn't like me much and therefore, you know, cast a wrath upon the SNP. And I, I believed, of course, that with a new leader, probably with John Swinney, who, you know, is just the most amazing guy that nobody could possibly dislike, uh, that he would get a much better run at it. In the wings of politics, Alex Salmond found plenty to occupy his time. Sandy, you're looking at me and you're thinking to yourself, what a load of warlocks. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right. Including as a regular panellist in TV studios. And with Paul Merton tonight is a media pundit, TV celebrity and quiz panellist, except for viewers in Scotland, where apparently he's some sort of politician, Alex Salmond. <laughs> But meanwhile, under John Swinney's leadership, the SNP failed to make ground. Four years after his election as leader, he stood down. I'm very proud of what I've achieved 
It's obviously not as much as I would have liked to have achieved, which is why I'm in front of you today. But uh, I'm proud of those achievements and uh, look forward to giving support to my successor in continuing the journey that we are now embarked upon. And at that point, can I thank you very much for coming along today and wish you well. Thank you. Alec was right and he was wrong. He was right in the sense that he was a kind of lightning conductor because you know the, the press either loved him or loathed him. Um, but he was wrong that he thought that somehow if he got out the road, I'd be getting showered with rose petals by the Scottish media and that my leadership would just sort of sail through advance. Salmond speedily and definitively ruled himself out of the race. If nominated, uh, I'll decline. If drafted, I'll defer. And if elected, I'll resign. Which left Rosanna Cunningham, Mike Russell and Nicola Sturgeon contesting the SNP leadership. Rosanna Cunningham looked like she might win. Alex Salmond favoured Nicola Sturgeon, which left him with a dilemma. I had a fair assessment of where the leadership contest was going. I mean, I've always believed Nicola Sturgeon should become leader of the Scottish National Party. It didn't look like she was winning at that time. For, for the very good reason uh, that she was clearly, you know, uh, among her peers, uh, uh, an exceptional, talented politician. And it did appear as that leadership contest took shape that that wasn't a, a guaranteed or perhaps even a likely outcome. With just hours to go before nominations closed, Alex Salmond entered the race. It is then with a, a degree of surprise and humility, but with a renewed determination, that I must tell you that I am a candidate for the leadership of the Scottish National Party. I have to say I was stunned when he came to see me and said, I'm thinking of coming back into the race. And, you know, he came to see me at um, the party headquarters in McDonald Road after a National Executive Committee meeting, and I was sitting there. My first reaction was to say, Are, have you gone daft? What is... Have you thought this through? Of course, with Alec, he had thought everything through. I had uh, every understanding that he was not going to stand and nothing would persuade him to stand, and therefore it was, if I may... Uh, be as, as calm about it as I wasn't then, uh, I was surprised when he stood uh, and I had less than 12 hours notice of it. Myself and Mike Russell, we either continued in the contest or we stepped down. And, you know, I just thought, well, do you know what? I've thrown my hat in the ring. I'm going to continue in the contest. Um, and, and Mike obviously took the same decision. But I don't think either of us had any expectation <laughs> at that point that there was any likelihood of winning. We knew Alec would win. I think one of my parting shots to Alec was, good luck with Nicola. <laughs> and saying, you know, I, you know, I won't see how you get on, but uh, do give me a phone and let me know, you know, which, uh, which you dutifully did. But, you know, I, I, because obviously Nicola was the one who was having to make the biggest sacrifice in all of that. To break the news, Alex Salmon chose a favourite restaurant of his near Linlithgow. His task? To sell Nicola Sturgeon the idea that she should forget about the leadership for now and run for deputy on a joint ticket. With him as leader. I kind of expected Nicola would say, yes, let's do that. He told me straight what he was considering, why he was considering it and what you know he thought we should do together as a team. But he said to me, uh, very, very frankly, that if I decided I didn't want to do that and I wanted to continue as leader, then that was fine. He would be perfectly happy and back me in doing that. He would stand aside? He gave me a veto on it. And uh, I told him I wanted to take some time to think about it, which I, I'm not sure he wasn't a wee bit surprised at that. But of course, being the talented uh, a determined young lady she is. She took 24 hours to think about it. <laughs> and it was, what were you doing, was, pacing anxiously? I wasn't pacing anxiously, but I, I must say, I, uh, I, I came away from the, the first talk and I thought to myself, yeah, actually thinking about it, that's exactly why she should become leader. Because it was a big ask that you were making? Because it was a big ask I was making and she had a proper and uh, entirely reasonable uh, appreciation of her own abilities. I suppose what I, I felt most was 
you know, I've put myself forward for leader of the party. What's it going to say about me and my seriousness in doing that if a few days later, as I think it was, or a couple of weeks later, I say, no, no, this other person is far better uh, able than me. But then I, I kind of took a step back from that and thought, well, what do I think is best for the SNP? And there was no way that I could come to any conclusion other than actually Alec is leader with me if the party elects me as deputy leader, I think it's a pretty good thing. Michael Russell, 631 votes for 9.65% of the vote. Alex Salmond, the MP, 4,952 votes for 75.76%. Seven, the joint ticket won handsomely, a typically flamboyant gesture by a politician who relishes victory and mischief. Alex Salmon's gamble paid off. He's wonderful at pretending that this is all part of the grand plan. But you know, Alex is an instinctive seat of the pants politician sometimes. And he's also a risk taker. And you should never diminish that. He used to say that his favourite quotation was that one from James Graham, the Marquis of Montrose. He either fears his fate too much or his deserts are small that will not put it to the touch to win or lose it all. He is the ultimate gambler in that regard. The glib term is gambler, but that's not really what it's about. Because I think in 2007, he would make a very swift calculation of what was and was not achievable. And he just did it. He, he's a gambler par excellence. And sometimes, I know, I'm certain, he doesn't know how that's going to turn out. You know, but he's great at, at making it appear that it was all a plan. And that's a wonderful skill in politics too. And Salmon the Gambler saw the 2007 Holyrood elections as a very attractive wager indeed. <laughs> I stood for Gordon, my neighbouring constituency in the north-east of Scotland, which was the 20th seat in the SNP's list of potential gains. To get a, become the largest party, we had to win 20 seats. <laughs> and so my reckoning was, well, look, if I stand for, for Gordon, which is the 20th seat, and we win Gordon, then the likelihood is that we'll have done enough yeah. to, to be challenging. On the other hand, if I don't win Gordon, uh, then hopefully we'll still have made substantial progress and uh, the, the future succession of the party will be secure in a, a very good challenging position for the future. I remember being in the Apex Hotel in January of 2007 with what became the Cabinet and various other advisors and people working with us. And we were asked to do this exercise to write down a piece of paper how many seats we thought we'd win. And at that time we had 27. So we all wrote down a bit of paper. And I think I wrote down something like 41 or 42. So we go around the table and everyone's got to open their envelope and, you know, I'm at 41 and 42 and various others are in the low 40s or high 30s or something like that. And we get to Alec last, opens his envelope, 47. And he looks at us and says, how do you think we're going to win the election if we just get 41 or 42? And I, I would trace back that moment to say that's the moment at which I sat up and I thought, he is deadly serious about winning this election. He is absolutely deadly serious. And that d dictated the atmosphere with which, within which we worked thereafter of being deadly serious about winning it. I heard a rumour. <laughs> I think we won the election. <laughs> One of my other memories of it all, I can remember driving over the fourth bridge, coming down to Edinburgh on the afternoon of the, the Friday and listening to Radio Scotland. And it was Bill Whiteford, I think, and he just said, eh, we're now going to, we're now going to eh, pause the commentary while we hear the, Mr. Salmon's helicopter arriving in Edinburgh. I was driving over the fourth bridge with tears streaming down my face when I heard them saying, Scotland will never be the same again.
Scotland has chosen a new political path, one which echoes the hopes and aspirations of a, a new culture in politics. Last night was a reminder that politicians exist to serve, not just to survive. The whole helicopter to Edinburgh, Preston Field lawn, Scotland will never be the same. I don't think, by that stage, we hadn't actually got 47 seats, but again, he had, he'd made the calculation and he had the boldness to lead from the front. Scotland has changed for good and forever. Uh, there may well be Labour governments and Labour first ministers in the decades to come, uh, but never again will we say the Labour Party assume that it has a divine right to rule Scotland. You know, my friend Alex Salmond had become the first minister of Scotland. How on earth had that happened compared to the, you know, the situation I joined in 1979 where we had two MPs, 14%, well, I think it was about 17% in the vote, and really nowhere to go. And my, my friend is now the First Minister of Scotland. How's that happened? So I, I view 2007 as the seminal moment. Alex Salmond is selected as this Parliament's nominee for appointment as First Minister. It was a famous victory. The SNP was Holyrood's largest party, but lacking an overall majority. Alex Salmond was First Minister, but he fretted over the challenge of sustaining a minority government. In 2007, when we got elected, uh, you know, it was as a minority government. Uh, few people gave us much of a chance. I, I recall even Alec himself, uh, uh, about three, four weeks in, I was uh, a bit uncertain about the path I'd taken. I was 24 years old. I felt a bit like a fish out of water. Like I said, you know, I'm not sure I'm cut out for this. Quite honestly, Alec, and he said, look, Jeff, don't worry about it. We'll only be in here for three months, so you might as well enjoy it while it lasts. Now, he was semi-kidding, of course, but, um, you know, there was a serious point behind that in that, you know, every day for those four years between 2007 and 11, as a minority government, it was like a campaign day. We had to, you know, uh, fight every day as if it might be our last, because it, it could be. He's a pragmatist. He knew, I've got to reach out here. I've got to make some alliances, because if I don't make these alliances, I'm not going to be able to govern them. 2007 election was a, a, a really classic Scottish, Scottish election result. It was maybe his eye, maybe his no. We'll let this lot in. They've only got one seat of a majority, of a lead. We'll see how they get on. And it's not so much if, they're, if, if they can't manage it, we'll tough them out. Well, to welcome you as well. It's what they found was that we were a group of people who had sat round the same table for, well, well, in Alec, in my case, we'd sat round the same table for about well, the best part of 20 years, over 20 years, um, working out how... So, you know, we all knew each other well with sort of all sorts of, you know, achievements and bruises in the bargain over the years of what we tried to, to, to deliver. Right, well, I've got £10 billion to spend, and Don's just told me that once I get the election, what I do with it is nothing to do with <laughs> So when we became the cabinet, we were strongly bound together, we knew how to work together, we knew how to lead the government. He incrementally built upon the 2007 victory in a very skilful, methodical way which paid the, the ultimate dividend in, in 2011. <laughs> In 2011, Alex Salmond had a government record to defend. Initially behind in the polls, the SNP expected to gain ground by the end of the campaign. But the full scale of the result was a shock to everyone. and a warm welcome to the Scottish election 2011. We'll be here right through the The night. results started coming through, uh, and the first one was actually a Labour victory, uh, but the swing to us was huge. And if that was to be replicated, which indeed it was, then you know, we knew that we were onto something quite special. But my job on the night was to keep him informed of all developments. And, and after a while, I just said, look, Alec, we're winning everything. And uh, I don't really have anything much to add to that. You know, I, I, I don't know what else you need to know, but uh, I think we're winning everything. And uh, it became quite clear that, you know, we were going to win a majority. Alec, I think he was overwhelmed by it. It was quite astonishing. Uh, I remember being next to him 
in Aberdeen at the count and uh, we took a very gracious call from Ian Gray who conceded the defeat and you could tell that he was quite overwhelmed by it taken aback almost and what a sense of responsibility this was and you know we were going to have a referendum at that point that was the, the stage in which it dawned and I think that it was it was a very surreal yet exciting experience. I'm honoured to announce that on Thursday the 18th of September 2014 we will hold Scotland's referendum a historic day where the people will decide Scotland's future. The SNP is predicated upon independence, built upon it. Its members yearn for it. Now, finally, after 80 years of existence, most of it in obscurity, the SNP had a leader with sufficient power to offer independence to the people of Scotland. He had low moments, not least the first leaders' debate, which pundits reckoned was won by Alastair Darling. I ask you again, the pound belongs to the UK, not to England, not to Scotland, not to Wales, not to Northern Ireland. It belongs to the United Kingdom. The Bank of England stands behind it. If we leave the United Kingdom, we leave the pound. What is your plan B if you don't get a currency union? This is most no. important. This is, uh... But colleagues cite his energy and his ability to bounce back from adversity. Obviously, ultimately, this is up to uh, the people of Great Britain. Uh, in the case of Scotland, uh, there's a referendum process in place, and it's up to the people of Scotland. I remember a colleague of mine, uh, I was in the corridor of the Scottish Parliament, said, oh, President Obama has just come out against Scottish independence. And uh, I can't uh, repeat on camera what my reaction was, but we can say that, safely say I said, uh, uh, suggest that he might be mistaken, the person that said this to me, uh, and uh, uh, he wasn't obviously, and, and President Obama had made a public statement, so my responsibility was to go to the First Minister, I was having a, a charity lunch at the time in the Parliament, and, and say to him, excuse me First Minister, I'm afraid uh, you know, President Obama's you know, said something about the Scottish independence uh, campaign, and he went, good? And I went, no, it's, it's not good. <laughs> we obviously have a deep interest in making sure that uh, one of the closest allies that we will ever have uh, remains a strong, robust, uh, united and effective partner. Got to his feet, he made his apologies, he had to, to leave the table and then said, right, get the cameras in, I know what to say. And I suppose I would reflect on two things. I mean, firstly, when Scotland becomes independent, America will have two allies rather than one as at the present moment. And secondly, rather more than 200 years ago, uh, America to fight for its independence. We are very fortunate in Scotland that we have a, a democratic, agreed, consented process by which we can vote for our independence. So in summary, I suppose my, my message to, to President Obama is, yes, we can. There was a huge opportunity in that for yes, and Alec saw that opportunity because it just raised the referendum, it elevated Scotland, it internationalised everything that we're about. And I think that made a lot of people in Scotland feel quite good. So I'd look at these things happening, you know, difficult bits of political news or political activity, and I'd think, gee whiz, this is tough going, you know. And in seconds, he'd be, right, let's do this, that, the next thing, you do this, you do da, 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 and we're off. And we're into fight back mode. And, and I've, seen that, I've seen this go from, you know, f staring disaster in the face to fight back mode in the bat of an eye. And it's always him that was engineering it. Alec is at his best when the chips are down. The more the pressure, the better he performs. And that acts as a great reassurance for those around him. You know, you look to him for leadership at, at the moments of, uh, you know, pressure or difficulty or crisis, and he's always there. Did there come a moment during the referendum when you thought you were winning and what was it like when ultimately you lost? I, I thought a week out we could win. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, the, the essential irony was the, the, the poll ten days before. 
<laughs> I, I, I was, uh, I, I had one of the great days of my life uh, in that, that day, I was in Inverness and the reception in the, in the street was extraordinary. I mean, they were you know, up the lamppost, <laughs> I mean, there was thousands of people. It was just a wonderful day and I thought, right, I'm going to get myself a game of golf because I've got to you know, get some perspective on what's going on. And there's no better way to get perspective and bring you down to earth than, than a game of golf. Tell me about it. So I got a call uh, saying that uh, Mr Murdoch was tweeting about an opinion poll. And so I told uh, Jeff Aberdeen, my chief of staff, find out what's in the poll. So Jeff uh, phones me back and I'm on about the third hole and playing well as now. And Jeff says it's 51-49. That's all he said. And I said, that's good. I said, I'm turning off the phone. I'm going to finish this game of golf. I thought it was 51, no, 49, yes. <laughs> so so I, got, I, got, I turned off the phone. I got back to the clubhouse, right? I turned the phone back and there's about 30 messages. So I phoned Jeff. I said, what's going on? I've got 30 messages here. He says, yeah, we're in the lead. I said, oh, no. <laughs> I said, <laughs> I was slightly stronger than that. <laughs> And because I realised, obviously, that that, that that was too early. I mean, the, the, the campaign plan was to hit the front with a day two to go. But sometimes these things are not given to you. The frenzied media attention thereafter for the closing kind of seven or eight days was just intense. And I actually think that worked against us because um, people were becoming alarmed just given the, the, the frenzied attention that that kind of poll and the aftermath was getting. But I did know the empire would strike back uh, and that they would uh, assemble. I didn't quite anticipate the vow. I, I just thought there'd be a hyping up of the scaremongering. I mean, see, I knew that the three amigos, the, the, the three Westminster party leaders, had something of a credibility gap, whatever they said. Gordon Brown has less of a credibility gap, and therefore for him to underwrite the vow, for the vow to be presented, quite disgracefully in many ways, but technically, uh, you know, a very good job by the, the Daily Record, in technical terms, you know, the parchment and all the rest of it. Because there will always be a, a, a group of people who would not like, and as nobody does, to, to say to themselves, I'm being scared out of something I believe in. But on the other hand, if they're offered a slightly easier option, where change is inevitable, uh, as the Prime Minister said, we're getting near federalism, mm -hmm. as Gordon Brown said, and I am underwriting these commitments from these free Westminster, I'm standing surety, the garden tour of the vow. You reckon that's what finally lost the referendum for well, you? I think that's what, uh, that's what, that's what decided, the I'm absolutely certain that's what decided the referendum. Yes, 16,350. No, 19,000. 19,036. Yes, 59,390. No, 84,000. Outcome for a yes. Number of votes, 27,243. Outcome for no, 27,329. Myself and Duncan Hamilton, a colleague of mine, had drafted um, both a, a yes statement and a no statement previously, you know, because we sent them up to him for his consideration. And to see only one coming back uh, with his amends to it, um, it was heartbreaking uh, and it was really deflating. Um, and it's, you know, it's that feeling that you've, you, you've, you've let people down uh, uh, that kind of overcame you but it happened so quickly of course that um, that you know you just have to go with the flow I left the count in Glasgow at I can't remember five or six o'clock on Friday morning uh, to go through to Edinburgh to meet up with him he'd flown down from Aberdeen uh, slightly earlier Uh, I spoke to him on the phone and the way through and, you know, we just shared the fact that we were both pretty gutted at not having won. When I got through to Edinburgh, uh, at that point, of course, he started to break the news to me that he was about to announce his resignation. So there were a few tears uh, on my part, I should say. Um, and 
you know, that whole day is a little bit of a blur, a very emotional day. Our referendum was an agreed and consented process and Scotland has, by majority, decided not at this stage to become an independent country. I, I accept that verdict of the people and I call on all of Scotland to follow suit in accepting the democratic verdict of the people of Scotland. That morning, you know, a combination of um, knowing that we'd lost the referendum and knowing that um, this colossal political figure was going to no longer be our leader made me kind of, I found that a profoundly sad confluence of events. I tried to persuade him not to do it. I tried to persuade him uh, at the very least not to do it that day, um, to take more time to think it through, to let the dust settle, to let you know the emotion of uh, all subside. But as I was doing that, I knew that I wasn't going to succeed. At that point, most of the staff, including myself, hadn't slept in, I think, about 52 hours, uh, I, I, I counted it at. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I, I'm going to make a, a brief statement, then I'll take, uh, I'll, I'll take some questions. It was, it was, you know, a huge coming together of emotions. You're just dealing with the, the aftermath of a no vote, which is devastating in itself, and they're the guy you've worked for for... Uh, you know, 10 years is, is stepping down from the position of First Minister. It has been the privilege of my life to serve as First Minister. But as I said often enough during this referendum campaign, uh, this is a process which is not about me or the SNP or any political party. It's much, much more important than that. The position is this. We lost the referendum vote, but Scotland can still carry the political initiative. Scotland can still emerge as the real winner. Uh, for me as, uh, as leader, my time is, uh, is nearly over. But for Scotland, the campaign continues and the dream shall never die. He did it and handled it extremely well. Um, and it was a great speech, it was a great statement. And uh, whilst uh, I was very gutted, uh, I was also very proud that uh, he'd handled himself so well in that moment, you know. Of course, waiting in the wings, a deputy who had set aside her own leadership ambitions when Alex Salmon decided to return ten years ago. Now, her moment had arrived. People cannot be lieutenants forever. You know, there is a natural progression in any organisation, including political parties, when people who have served their time should get their chance to, to show what they can do. And that's a healthy thing in an organisation. You know, one man can't be a political party. No more than one man can be a nation. And the key point is to recognise that, address it, and when the time comes, to, to realise what to do about it. And that meant that today, Nicola Sturgeon was formally elected Salmon's successor as First Minister. I declare that Nicola Sturgeon is selected as this Parliament's nominee for appointment as First Minister. Alex Salmon still intends to be active in politics. His successor welcomes that, but within strictly defined limits. He won't be backseat driving. I'll be leader of the SNP and I will be... First Minister of Scotland, I'll be taking the decisions and I'll be responsible and accountable for those decisions for better or for worse. I wouldn't lead the party on any other basis. Will he be somebody that I proactively look to for advice and help and support and guidance? Absolutely. You know, he's been a source of all of that for me for 20 years. It would be absurd if I didn't continue to do that. But the decisions will be mine, and I'm very, very clear about that. Have you told uh, him I, that? You've told him it's I, well, my show? I, I don't need to don't tell need him to. that. He knows that. But if I ever need to tell him, yes, absolutely, I will tell him in no uncertain terms. But if I... And, and here's something I've told myself, and I will keep telling myself. If I ever find myself as a leader in a position where I am feeling resentful of or precious about Alec giving me advice or Alec speaking out or saying things, 
I'll give myself a good shake because that would be a ridiculous position for me to be in. He is a colossus in Scottish politics. His experience, his ability, his understanding of the whole political scene in Scotland is such that I would be daft if I decided that was a well of experience that I didn't want to draw on. What do you think will be your legacy? Well, I hope I've advanced uh, Scotland's cause to, uh, to, some, to some regard. Uh, I think the process of the referendum, I, I suppose no politician will want to be remembered for process as opposed to, to uh, achievement. However, I think there might be a, an exception here. I actually think the process of the referendum is one of the most important things that's ever happened to Scotland, indeed ever happened to any developed uh, modern democracy. The political engagement, the electrification of politics, the mobilisation of, uh, of mass interest in the political process. Now, was I solely responsible for that? Of course not. There were tens of thousands. It's been the whole point about a mobilisation is <laughs> there's many people to mobilise. Uh, but could it have happened without me? No, it probably couldn't. And therefore, I'm kind of pleased uh, about the referendum experience. Not about the result, but about the experience, because I think that's changed Scotland for the better, and it's changed Scotland for good. And will lead ultimately to independence. I believe it will, yes. Which leaves us with the question, what is at the core of the man? What drives Alex Salmond? He is a politician to his fingertips. But what drives him is the political profession that he has been in, you know, all his life. And the fact that he is a supreme player at it. I mean, he's, you know, the best. That's what drives him. The trouble is that that breeds a certain shamelessness, a certain opportunism, a certain uh, tendency to go for the jugular, even when it, when it isn't necessary. Um, and I think that's it, really. Um, he loves politics. Whatever happened, he led it. He, he you know, gathered the pieces together and um, created his independence vehicle. And he led that, and he led it with aplomb. There's no doubt about it. Well, I think he will be disappointed that his legacy was not a yes vote on the 18th of September. I think it's very, very difficult uh, if you have set yourself at such a, a visible and obvious target and you don't achieve it. Does that mean his political career is a failure? Uh, no, I don't think so, because he got within 10 points. Who would have believed that? And if one of the opinion polls is to believed, he was within three or four points. He can be a tough, tough boss, but he's also one of the funniest, uh, most mischievous and kindest and most supportive people that I know. So there's much more to Alex Salmond than people who've observed him, I guess, from the outside over all these years would possibly know. Well, Alec will always be a rebel. He'll, you know, he's always, you know, he's a rebel with a cause. I know what his cause is. His cause is absolutely crystal clear. It's never wavered. I think some people, you know, some people would have accused him, you know, of being a, a you know, a gradualist, you know, a sort of soft and devolution and all this kind of stuff. But it was all part of his calculation. He knew that a devolved Scottish Parliament would be an asset to the winning of Scottish independence. And you cannot look at the last 40 years of Scottish history and come to any other conclusion. <laughs>